Good evening, and welcome to tonight's Humanities Lecture Series. I'm Sally Utek, the Acting Director of the Hall Center, which organizes this event. It's our great pleasure this evening to bring you journalist and author Evan Osnos. Tonight, he will be talking about his book, Age of Ambition, Chasing Fortune, Truth, and Faith in the New China, which won the 2014 National Book Award in nonfiction and was a finalist for the 2015 Pulitzer in nonfiction. Based partly on his reports in The New Yorker, the book describes his travels in China, where he interviewed people experiencing a time of remarkable economic, political, and social change. Reviewers have declared that Evan Osnos has portrayed, explained, and poked fun at this new China better than any writer from the East or West. I've asked John Head to introduce tonight's speaker. John Head is the Robert W. Wagstaff Distinguished Professor of Law here at KU. He holds both an English law degree from Oxford University and a JD from the University of Virginia. Before joining the KU Law faculty, he was in private practice in Washington, D.C., and served as legal counsel to the Asian Development Bank and the International Monetary Fund. He has taught law in several countries in Europe and Asia and occasionally undertakes overseas assignments there and elsewhere involving international financial law, international organizations, and international legal training. He has served as the Paul Hastings Visiting Professor at the University of Hong Kong and has held two Fulbright Fellowships, one to Beijing in 1994 at Remnan University of China and the other to the University of Trento in 2009 as part of the Fulbright Distinguished Chairs Awards Program. His scholarly books and articles focus mainly on international and comparative law with emphasis on the legal aspects of international business, international environmental protection, and international economic relations. He has authored or co-authored three books on Chinese law and history, including one titled China's Legal Soul and another released in 2013 titled Legal Transparency in Dynastic China, The Legalist Confucianist Debate and Good Governance in Chinese Tradition. His current research projects revolve around international agricultural law and policy. So please help me welcome John Head. Thank you very much for the gracious introduction. That was a little bit longer than I was expecting. I'm hoping that won't cut into my time to introduce our speaker tonight. I'd like to whet your appetite a bit uh, for what Evan Osnos has to tell us tonight by touching briefly on his background and his writing. I might mention at the outset that uh, although this enriching book, uh, Age of Ambition, as Sally mentioned, earned Mr. Osnos the National Book Award for Nonfiction and several other awards, his articles in the New Yorker also deserve close attention. Just over a week ago, for instance, in advance of President Xi Jinping's visit with Donald Trump, Mr. Osnos observed that um, as of only a few years ago, China's leaders were deeply concerned, quote, that their people were being seduced by the moral glamour of American democracy by the open-hearted confidence of the shining city on a hill and by the ability of a nation founded on slavery to elect its first African-American president. President Xi worried that the American example of competence, generosity, and contempt for authoritarianism would someday drive his own people to challenge the rule of the Communist Party. Mr. Osnos concludes by saying that President Xi, quote, has less need, reason to worry about that today. Mr. Osnos graduated from Harvard in 1998 with a major in government and started shortly thereafter as a reporter at the Chicago Tribune. In 2008, he joined the New Yorker and served as that magazine's China correspondent until 2013. It was during his time in China that Mr. Osnos gathered a mountain of details about the lives of many individual members of modern Chinese society. What he learned about them and what he tells us in this book is that we cannot understand China without some appreciation for the collision of two great forces, aspiration and authoritarianism. He points out that, quote, 40 years ago, the Chinese people had virtually no access to fortune, truth, or faith because those three things had been denied them by politics and poverty. They had no chance to build a business, no power to challenge propaganda, no way to find moral inspiration outside the party. 
But within a generation, they had gained access to all three, that is, fortune, truth, and faith, and they want more. He says, the Chinese people have taken control of freedoms that used to be governed almost entirely by others, decisions about where they work and travel and whom they marry. Let me pause just there for a moment. When my wife and our three young children and I lived in Beijing in, in 1994, uh, we saw firsthand out of how, how two out of the three things uh, that are mentioned there, where people work and where people travel, were in fact outside their own control. Each of my law students at Renmin University, for instance, was assigned to a Donway or work unit immediately upon graduation, largely independent of that student's own preferences. Mr. Osnos explains that those central controls have now been dismantled, but still, he says, ambition and authoritarianism collide dramatically in today's China. As a result, he writes that although, quote, the Chinese Communist Party has unleashed the greatest expansion of human potential in world history, I think that's worth repeating, greatest expansion of human potential in world history, it has also created perhaps the greatest threat to its own survival. James Fallows, in reviewing this book, has emphasized the same breathtaking internal contradictions in China, what Fallows refers to as the combination of hope and despair, idealism and crassness, coordinated mass action, and chaotic individual scheming. Fallows says that Evan Osnos has captured all parts of this disorienting reality and offers us a better understanding of China's process of, quote, becoming than most people could ever gain by living there. One aspect of this process of becoming that particularly interests me and that I hope Mr. Osnos will touch on briefly this evening goes to the question of identity and especially national identity. My own sense, having observed China for a number of years, is that the search for a national identity has proven extraordinarily difficult. And yet, such a national identity would seem to be so extraordinarily important for a country of such significance as modern China. I've surmised in one of my books that China's national legal identity cannot be found in Confucianism or in New Confucianism or in constitutionalization or in the rule of law or in any form of religion, but may be found instead in a striving for materialism, a thirst for legitimation on the world stage, an embrace of outside cultural influences, especially from the West, and yet a countervailing insistence that China set its own terms rather than accept Western terms for its own rise to power. So like Mr. Osnos, I see deep contradictions and collisions in modern China. What I have not done, of course, is to write about this from the perspective of hundreds of individual members of today's Chinese society. And it is that perspective, along with the talent that Mr. Osnos has for telling those people's stories with liveliness and generosity and authenticity that makes this book so good and that it should make us all eager to hear what Mr. Osnos has to tell us tonight. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Evan Osnos. That was marvelous. Thank you for coming Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, John. That was really just an, an, a thoughtful and astute uh, summary of, the, of my approach to the place. Frankly, I think I should quit now while I'm ahead because uh, your uh, esteem is only going to decline from here. Um, I am uh, really grateful for the chance to be here, and, and thank you uh, to the Hall Center for having me. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a treat to be here talking on a subject that I care about and love talking about. And I know there are a lot of people here who have one or another angle onto the subject. And I will look forward to talking about whatever's on your mind in Q&A. But before that, I, I'm going to talk tonight about the very subject that John mentioned, which is identity. And in a sense, what does it mean to be Chinese uh, in 2017? Um, as we get started, I wonder if I might uh, ask you for a show of hands on a couple of questions. Uh, number one, please raise your hand if you've had reason to visit China at any point. All right, I figure it's a self-selecting crowd after all. <laughs> number two, um, please raise your hand if you think that 10 years from now, 
China's economy will still be going strong. All right. And number three, raise your hand, please, if you think 10 years from now, China's political system may look substantially different than it does today. Okay. I, by the way, you will not be held accountable for your predictions this evening. Um, I thought to ask those questions uh, because I thought that a straw poll might evoke I think it did, some of the very complex feelings that we have about China right now, because on the one hand, it can look very strong at some moments, and at others, it can look very weak or fragile. It can look to us, I think, like it's perhaps a partner of the United States in some respects, but also perhaps a rival or even something fiercer at other moments. It's just this very uncertain moment in China's development and also, of course, in its relationship with the United States. But above all, it now sort of factors into our conversations. It comes up in our conception of the world in a way that it simply didn't uh, 10 years ago. And, it, you know, on the geostrategic level, on uh, the question of how American businesses will orient themselves around the world, but even also on the level of things as sort of um, mundane or private as what kind of languages our kids are going to study. We have a one-year-old at home, actually, and we're thinking about that right now. Uh, do we want him to study Mandarin? My view is that if we encourage him to study Mandarin, then he'll hate it. So we have to probably steer him towards German, and he'll end up studying Mandarin or something. Um, if you want to know what it actually feels like to live and write in China, uh, which is, on some level, the subject of this evening's conversation, I, I find it's useful to remember an observation by John King Fairbank, who was the great... China scholar uh, started the program where I eventually studied years later. And Fairbank said, uh, quote, China is a journalist's dream and a statistician's nightmare because, he said, it has more human drama and fewer verifiable facts per square mile than anywhere else in the world. I once mentioned that to the fact-checking department at the New Yorker, and they didn't find that funny in the slightest, actually. They didn't, they didn't see why I liked that quote. Um, Fairbank said that in 1947. And in some ways, there's some truth to it today in the sense that it is still a place that is both baffling and utterly addictive as a writer. Uh, but in other ways, I think China is a much more knowable place than it ever has been before because it's simply a place where you can now go and live uh, in a Chinese environment in a way that you simply couldn't do in his day. I mean... I was lucky to be there at a time when you could go and live in a Chinese neighborhood for eight years just among uh, ordinary households. And that was a fundamentally different kind of experience and a fundamentally different analytical experience from what China scholars and other people were doing uh, even 25 years ago. I mean, when I got to China in 2005, at that point, we were just now, at the, for the first time, journalists were being allowed to move out and live anywhere they wanted in the city. Um, and that's what I did, and for that reason had a, a, a completely different kind of experience than the generations that came before. I'd like to read uh, just a few uh, lines, just a couple of lines from the very beginning of Age of Ambition, because I think it'll give you a feel for uh, the angle of approach, how I looked at the subject. Whenever a new idea sweeps across China, a new fashion, a philosophy, a way of life, the Chinese describe it as a fever. In the first years after the country opened to the world, people contracted Western business suit fever and Jean-Paul Sartre fever and private telephone fever. It was difficult to predict when or where a fever would ignite or what it would leave behind. In the village of Xiajia, population 1,564, there was a fever for the American cop show, Hunter, or better known in China as expert detective Hung Tu. When the show appeared on Chinese television in 1990, the villagers of Xiajia, the villagers of Xiajia started to gather to watch Detective Rick Hunter of the Los Angeles Police Department go undercover with his partner, Detective Didi McCall. And the villagers of Xiajia came to expect that Detective Rick Hunter would always find at least two occasions to utter his trademark phrase, "Works for me." Though in Chinese, he came across as a religious man because works for me was mistranslated as whatever God wants. <laughs> the fever passed from one person to the next and it affected each in a different way. 
Some months later, when the police in Xiajia tried to search the home of a local farmer, the man told them to come back when they had a warrant, a word that he had learned from expert detective Hung Tu. So why do I begin a book on contemporary China with the um, very specific experience of one village 25 years ago? Because it's a, a way of seeing. Uh, it's a focus on the intimate changes in people's lives, the perceptual changes, the changes that frankly don't often appear in the headlines in the newspaper about China. But in some ways, those are the kinds of changes and the forces that really are propelling China through this moment in its history. And those are the things that people talk to you about if you hang around long enough and worm your way into their lives. Um, this is a period that I've come to call the age of ambition. Uh, and by that, I'm referring to two very specific kinds of ambition. One is this quite visible national aspiration to stake out a, a greater, more glorious place in the world. And then the other kind of ambition is the individual aspirations of 1.4 billion Chinese people. And each one of those is slightly different and idiosyncratic and defined by a very personal combination of goals and fears and anxieties and loves and, uh, and tastes. And that, if you understand the way these two forces, these two kinds of ambition fit together, I think it begins to explain China in a way that is more logical from looking at it far away. You begin to understand some of the tensions that are driving China internally and then also some of its tensions with the rest of the world. And that's what I'll be talking about tonight in more detail. Uh, in order to talk about China, where it is and where it's going, I think it's useful to remind ourselves just a little bit about the path that it's followed on the last, say, 20 years, 25, 30 years to get to this point. We're not going to rehearse the whole history, but I do want to give you a feel for some of the key moments that I think shape where we are today. For me, you know, China, as a big part of my life, started 22 years ago when I walked into a class on contemporary Chinese politics. I had no background in the subject, but I was absolutely transfixed. Uh, you had this incredible story, which is really how I sort of thought of it. Um, this was a story of the end of an empire and civil war and the rise of the Communist Party and these, you know, these massive protean and in many ways flawed figures like Chairman Mao, who then, of course, was followed by Deng Xiaoping, who led China out of seclusion back into the world. He's the one who said, we will open up the economy while retaining rigid control over the politics. And then you had, in 1989, the Tiananmen Square demonstrations, which, when I started studying the subject, it happened just five years earlier. And I was sort of mesmerized by those events because the people who I was seeing were barely older than I was. You remember, this was when Students, after all, occupied the very citadel of party power, the center of Beijing. You know, it was the equivalent of them setting up right in front of the White House. And they occupied the center of Beijing for, for months on end, and it ended in bloodshed, and, and people marked that uh, anniversary, the 25th anniversary in 2014. But if you watched it at the time or in the years afterwards, what you saw was very clearly that China was being torn between, young people especially, were torn between being of the West or of the East. They had these two temptations. Did they want to be utterly Chinese or did they want to be somehow more cosmopolitan? And you saw it visibly. I mean, they had shag haircuts and they had these, they wore bell bottoms and they would sing uh, Western songs. And they quoted Patrick Henry in the square. They had placards that said, give me liberty or give me death. And yet at the same time, they would sing the old Internationale. This is the great Communist Party hymn. And when they delivered their demands, they did it in the traditional style, in a petition. And they delivered it on their knees. They gave it to these kind of ancient party apparatchiks who were still wearing Mao suits. But you've sensed, if you watch those events, this was a, a generation that was going to be much more, much more demanding of China and of history. You know, they demanded much more of their own, of their own lives. They wanted more out of China and out of their own experience. And there was a student protester who said to a reporter that spring, and I've thought about this a lot ever since, he said, I don't know exactly what we want, but we want more of it. And I flew to Beijing uh, for the first time in 1996 to begin studying uh, Chinese. And at the time, you know, it was a very different place than it is today. China at the time had an economy that was smaller than that of Italy. 
and just as a sensory experience, it was very, it was very different. Beijing at that point felt much more like Mongolia than it did like Hong Kong. It was a pretty gritty place up there on the North China Plain. If you wanted to go out for a night out, you know, get a good meal, you'd go to the Jiangua Hotel, which I found out later the architect proudly described it as a perfect replica of a Holiday Inn that he had seen in Palo Alto, California. Today, China is home to 30% of the skyscrapers under construction, uh, even with the slowdown in the economy, which is very real and, and substantial and happy to talk about it later, it is still a place in which the defining dynamic is growth. And the defining dynamic over the last two, gener two decades has been growth. You know, people in China today no longer want for food. Uh, your average person eats about six times as much meat as he or she did in 1976, just to put it in very tangible terms. And yet this is actually, a, a, I think of it as a ravenous period, a hungry period for other things, because people are ravenous for experiences and for ideas, for information and for respect. And that's in some ways the, the defining thing of this time. But really the key thing to think about economically is that this last period, this generation, has not brought great fortune to most Chinese people. Of course, it has just allowed them to take the first few steps out of poverty to the point that in 1978, your average person made about $200 a year. Today, they make about $7,000 a year. But the gap in income is profound. I mean, the gap in income and life expectancy in China between its richest places and its poorest places is the difference between New York City and Ghana. All of this within the borders of one country, and it's not just any country, it's a country still, after all, governed by the Chinese Communist Party. So if you think that you know, the gap between rich and poor is an electrifying political issue here, it is a source of immense uncertainty and tension uh, in China's future. So what do Chinese leaders want? What do they actually want? What is their national ambition? Well, I was, uh, I, I, let's talk for just a second about what it is that they imagine for the future. The, uh, the current generation of leadership came to power in 2012. I was living in Beijing, of course, and, and I got this invitation to go see the unveiling of the leadership, which is really what it is. It's an unveiling, because you don't know at that point who is going to be running the country. Uh, and it's always held in the same place at the Great Hall of the People. And the pageantry is quite revealing, because as you see, the first thing you noticed when they came out on stage was conformity. You know, they wore virtually identical dark suits. They had virtually identical red ties, with the exception of one who's wearing a blue tie. And if anybody's curious, just ask me about it in Q&A. Um, it has meaning. Um, their hair was dyed to an almost identical shade of black, which is not a laugh line. That's a real thing. It's a sign of vitality and relevance in Chinese politics. And the reason this was the case, why did they want this sort of sense of conformity to come across so clearly? It was that after this period of great turbulence in Chinese politics, the message to anybody who was watching this at home, and there were a few hundred million people watching it at home, the message was, we have come together. We are speaking with one voice. There is no division, no idiosyncrasy, no tension among us. We are as one. And then the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, steps forward to give his first address to the nation, as general secretary of the party, and what he says is quite notable. What he says is, it is my duty to lead the great renewal of the nation. And that phrase, the great renewal of the nation, he said, that is the Chinese dream. He used that expression over and over again in the weeks ahead. And all of a sudden, that became the central slogan of the government. You began to see the slogan on bus shelters. It was on television all the time. It was always on the front page of the newspaper. So the question is, well, what is the Chinese dream? What does that tell us about China's national ambitions? Well, the answer is some of it is about continuing the sort of physical reconstruction of the country. You know, this is a place, after all, that is building more railroads and high-speed high speed railroads and airports than the rest of the world combined. Um, it has landed a spacecraft on the moon. It's talking about a mission to Mars. It's talking about reaching the deepest reaches of the ocean. China now loans more money to the developing world than does the World Bank. But really, the idea of the Chinese dream was also about something larger than that, something less concrete. It was about a call to unify. Because at the time, 
China was, divi was divided in so many ways around ideas and income and opportunity and justice. And what the Communist Party was saying was you must come together underneath the leadership of the party in order to return China to this position that it held for most of human history, which was as the preeminent civilization in Asia, a country, after all, as every Chinese school child can tell you, a country that was printing 400 years before Gutenberg, and yet it somehow lost its way. This is a country, after all, as, as, as they will tell you, uh, they had controlled as much as a third of the world's wealth in the 18th century. And this is the position that they wanted to return themselves to. And in order to do so, they had to pull together in Xi Jinping's conception. So, as you would expect, you know, this new kind of larger, more glorious vision of China's role in the world has introduced a certain amount of tension into the relationship that China has with the rest of the world because it's beginning to make claims on territory in the South China Sea and in the East China Sea. And it's, it's sort of demanding a much larger position in Asia than it had even a few years ago. But if we focus for a moment on what China says about on what this says about China's intentions in the world, I think it's natural for us to ask, does China seek to supplant the United States as the preeminent power in the world today? You know, is that really ultimately what its amb ambitions are? I, we certainly feel that way when our own politics can feel kind of fragile uh, or uh, adrift at some moments. But I think there are reasons to believe that as much as China certainly sees itself taking a much larger role than it had a generation ago, Chinese leaders are really not prepared at this point to challenge the disposition overnight. Because for all of China's gains over the course of the last generation, it is still in many ways a developing country. And if you are the leading power in the world, it comes with very specific and expensive responsibilities. You know, the responsibility to police global sea lanes, which is so essential for China's economy, or to step in in the case of a crisis like Ebola or ISIS. I was in West Africa during the Ebola crisis, and you saw it on display that the U.S. was coming in, kind of reluctantly, but coming in, and Chinese road crews were leaving. They were going home because they don't have any experience with this. It's dangerous. It's expensive. So at this moment, instead of imagining that China is going to just sort of catapult itself past the United States, I think it's more realistic to see it as China trying to reestablish its position in a multipolar world in which there will no longer be one single preeminent superpower. In the most literal terms, you know, China today has one aircraft carrier, the United States has about a dozen. So the gap is still quite substantial. So if that's what, you know, China's vision, Chinese leader Xi Jinping's vision of the Chinese dream is about, about restoring this place, I think the question we should be asking ourselves is, well, what is this other kind of ambition about, you know, when the, the ordinary ambition of, the ambition of ordinary Chinese people. And in order to answer that, we have to talk a little bit more about, well, what does, what do Chinese people, after all, want today? Because that is the source of the country's energy, but it's also a source of immense uncertainty. I think it's useful to point out that the idea of individual ambition at all uh, really didn't merit much attention as recently as a few years ago. For most of Chinese history, it was not a subject that you talked about because the individual really wasn't the relevant unit of measure. You know, it, it was always, people were always understood to be embedded in these much larger units and forces. It was always the family or the village or the military unit or the country. And ultimately, the person uh, was less important. And you could see this expressed in a whole variety of ways in the politics, in social relations, and also in the art. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, this is a, a famous Chinese painting called Travelers Amid Mountains and Streams by Fan Quan from the 11th century. But the only person, the only individual in this picture is down here in the corner. It's a, a horseman driving a, a, a line of donkeys through the mountains. And if you saw that in the 11th century or any of the centuries that followed, you know, the message was quite clear. This is where you fit into the cosmos. That's about as much attention as you should attach to your own desires and wants and, um, and tastes. And then you compare that, let's say, to the equivalent, most famous Western classical image, a full-frame portrait of an individual. I think this is 
It's not, it's not a surprise that we invented the selfie, after all. We are inclined in that direction. But this also extended to the law. In China, as recently as the 18th, 19th century, if you were an individual charged with a crime, you weren't, uh, the judge didn't just consider the intrinsic facts of the crime itself, but also the degree of disruption to the social relationships. If you killed somebody of a higher rank, you were punished differently than if you killed somebody of a lower social rank. And when it came time for punishment, it wasn't just the person, the defendant, who was punished, but it was also family members and the village uh, community and leaders and neighbors. It, everybody was understood to be sort of uh, connected in ways that you couldn't pry them apart. And even the word ambition, to which I attach so much uh, interest, that word, one of the ways in Chinese that you say ambition is ye xin, which is literally wild heart. And wild heart had a very negative connotation. I mean, for, for a long time, you, if you said somebody had a wild heart, it meant that they had a kind of a sort of wolfish ambition to put themselves ahead of others. And uh, in the, uh, there's a collection of advice for rulers that was written a couple thousand years ago called the Huainanzi. And the Huainanzi said, quote, keep power out of the hands of the ambitious just as you would keep sharp tools out of the hands of the foolish. I've thought of that occasionally recently, I have to admit. Um, <laughs> now that idea, that sort of sense of the role that ambition played, this kind of dangerous role that it played, that continued into the heyday of socialism. It was quite congenial to the heyday of socialism when, after all, you know, people were constantly being reminded that they should be sacrificing for the collective good and they all would stand to benefit from collective gains. The state newspapers used to tell people that their highest calling under socialism was to be, quote, in the immortal phrase, a rustless screw in the revolutionary machine. And the pressure to conform reached its most intense during the Cultural Revolution. Now, that was the period when really any deviation from orthodoxy was dangerous. I mean, it could really imperil you or your family. And there was a great anthropologist, Arthur Kleinman, who went and asked people what they had. He was a sinologist, psychiatrist, and anthropologist. And he went around all over China asking people, what did you learn from your experience of the Cultural Revolution? And he interviewed a doctor who'd suffered terribly. He'd been sent out to the far western reaches of the desert. His wife had committed suicide out there. And he was asked, what did you take from the experience of the Cultural Revolution? And the doctor said this. He said, quote, to survive in China, you must reveal nothing to others or it can be used against you. Let your public self be like rice in a dinner, bland and inconspicuous. But I have to tell you that in the China where I've lived for you know, most of the last decade, that framework as a way of understanding the place is less and less operative, less and less useful, and we have to update it. The change that I'm describing can be traced to many moments, but clearly one of the most important moments was 1978-1979, when China began this process under Deng Xiaoping of moving towards the market, beginning to loosen control over people's lives. There were a huge number of ways in which, obviously, you were still under the thumb of the state, you know, and free expression and political organization. But people began to regain some degree of autonomy over some of the things about where they wanted to work or where they wanted to live or how they wanted to live and so on. And year by year, people began to leave these collective farms and factories. One of the words that people used to describe it was songbang, which is to literally unfetter an animal or a prisoner. That's how essential the feeling felt to leave one of these collective organizations. And as people were songbang and they began to sort of regain autonomy over their lives, uh, they stopped saying that, you know, you had to live up to be a restless screw in the revolutionary machine. The language was sort of changing on that score. And at one point I set aside a newspaper that was telling people in a headline, quote, you must rely on yourself blaze your own path, and fight. And you began to hear this in the language, too. Even the word ye xin, wild heart, uh, which I mentioned earlier, you know, it lost some of its negative connotation. It began to edge into neutral territory. And then it began to, over the last few years, sort of acquire a more positive connotation to the point that if you go on to, into a Chinese bookstore today, you can buy a book like this, which is How to Arouse a Wild Heart in your children. There's also versions of it for how to have a wild heart in your 20s and so on. And advertisers picked up on this. They began to sell things using this kind of language. So China Mobile, which is the big cell phone provider, they started to sell things by saying it's, you know, the slogan was my turf, my decision. 
And you might think, okay, well, this is happening in the cities, but probably not out in the countryside. Maybe in the countryside it's exactly as it's always been. But like a lot of things in China, it starts in the cities and then moves out into the rural area to the point that if you go to a rural school today in the Yangtze River Delta, you'll find that they start every day with the following pledge. The kids say, quote, Ever since God created all things on earth, there has not been one person like me. My eyes and my ears, my brain and my soul, all are exceptional. Nobody speaks or behaves like me. No one before me and no one will after me. I am the biggest miracle of nature. I've thought, what's it like to teach a room full of kids who say that every morning? It would be <laughs> character building. Um, but what you're hearing is that you know, China, in, in China today, people are asking themselves basically, what do I want? You know, what do I want for myself? What do I want for my country? And what am I willing to risk in order to help get myself there? I'll, I'll give you one example of what it feels like to be caught up in this. Um, I met a graduate student not long after I moved to China uh, named Gong Haiyan. And she was, at that point, you know, she came from this generation. She was born in the mid-70s, so after the worst years of the Cultural Revolution. She, her parents couldn't read or write. They were farmers. Uh, but she'd gotten a pretty good education because she was growing up after the political turbulence. So she went off to Beijing. She got her BA. She then went on to get her graduate degree in, in Shanghai. And then her parents said, okay, it's time to come home and get married. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the way we've always done it for thousands of years. It'll, some, some version of this um, will introduce you to somebody. And, you know, traditionally in China, uh, love and marriage was not a matter that was left to amateurs. This was left to professionals, matchmakers. Um, and they would line up two families of similar financial, wor uh, financial background or political background. It was called two, they would say, line up two doors of the same size is the term in Chinese. And, uh, but as people were regaining some, or gaining for the first time, some autonomy over their economic lives, they began to want to have more control over their romantic lives and, and sort of who they were going to marry. And actually, I watched over the course of the time I was there, people really bear hugged this new opportunity to decide who it was they wanted to spend the rest of their lives with. I started collecting uh, personals ads as a window into what people wanted out of life, what they wanted out of a partner. And I'll read you an example of what I, what I mean here. This is a... Uh, this is a personals ad by a young woman named Lin Yu, who's in graduate school in the city of Wuhan. And Lin Yu, in the city of Wuhan, placed an ad in the newspaper seeking a young man with the following qualities. No previous marriages, master's degree or more, not an only child, no smokers, no alcoholics, no gamblers, not from Wuhan, taller than 172 centimeters, ready for at least a year of dating before marriage, sporty, parents who are still together, annual salary over 50,000 yuan, age between 26 and 32, willing to guarantee eating four dinners at home each week, track record of at least two ex-girlfriends but no more than four, no Virgos, no Capricorns. And if anybody's interested, just see me afterwards and I'll put you together. But Gong Haiyan basically realized that there was this, there was a huge number of people facing a very similar moment that she was, a very similar predicament. And she saw a business opportunity uh, and she started a company called Shizhi Jiayuan, which is like the, means beautiful destiny. And it's essentially the Chinese match.com. And it became very popular. It became the most, uh, the most popular dating site in China. After a few years, she took it public on the NASDAQ and made $77 million. And all of this happened, you know, so fast in some sense that it, you know, in some ways, it's like her habits couldn't even catch up with her, the transformation of her economic experience to the point that I went and visited her house uh, and she'd moved from this little tiny apartment out into the suburbs where she was living with her husband who she'd met on the dating site that she founded. And, uh, and in the front hall, the first thing I saw when I walked in was the family moped. And I said, well, why is it in the front hall? And she said, I think it's just safer this way. And I was like, I think you're okay. Your next door neighbor is the Swiss ambassador. I don't think he's going to take it from you. <laughs> but look, there's nothing ordinary about or typical about Gong Haiyan. And it's, you know, it'd be absurd to hold her up as an example of uh, a typical experience. But the reason she's interesting is sort of the reason why we want to read about Steve Jobs 
as a, a portrait into a certain kind of dynamic in the United States, which is that it reflects a moment, a sense of possibility in which people are, if the right elements align, uh, able to sort of define what it is that they want and then pursue it within the boundaries that the politics provide. And this period, I, I've come to define the dynamics as the pursuit of fortune, pursuit of tra truth, and the pursuit of faith. And I'll tell you just briefly what I mean. The pursuit of fortune, I think, is the one that's most obvious. I'm not going to belabor the point. It's the kind of opportunity that, for the first time really in history, people have the opportunity, as Gong Haiyan did, to define how she wants to pursue her fortune and what she's going to do to get herself there. What's interesting is what happens next. And that's the pursuit of truth. Because what happens is once you begin to assemble the, the nest egg, once you've got the house and the car, you begin to need to understand more about the world around you. You know, you, you, in a sense, you can no longer afford to be uninformed. Because in order to protect this property that you've fought so bitterly for, you have to understand, you know, what are the rules in my society? Who's setting the rules? Why are some people allowed to do some things and I'm not? Or you begin to wonder about, well, you know, what is the, what is the air that I'm breathing? You know, because you've, you've sort of established some level of physical security in your immediate environment, but then you begin to wonder about your children's health. And you say, well, you know, the newspaper says it's fog, it says it's fine, but I'm not so sure because you can now have a smartphone app in a number of Chinese cities, some places it's blocked, other places it's not, where you can see what the air quality measurements are and compare it to the WHO standards in real time. And that's this pursuit of truth that I'm talking about, which is all of a sudden people have sort of discovered that they can no longer afford to not understand more about, about their country. Uh, for instance, they want to know why some people are able to break the rules in ways that your ordinary people are not. This is Liu Zhidrin, who is the Minister of Railways, who was heroically corrupt. I mean, just a person, an entrepreneur of corruption on a scale that the world really has never seen. He was known as Mr. 4%. Uh, because he obtained for himself a substantial piece of every deal. And he's on the front page of the newspaper. And so all of a sudden it sort of feeds this, it feeds this desire to want to know more. And that's what leads you to the last piece, which is, in, I think, the most interesting, which is the pursuit of faith. Because what happens is, you know, as you begin to answer questions about your ordinary sort of terrestrial experience, you begin to, you begin to ask bigger, larger, deeper questions about, well, you know, what am I here for? You know, what's my purpose in life? Because the Communist Party and the, the kind of fusion of the free market and uh, Leninist uh, uh, statism were as able to provide answers to economic questions to one degree or another over the last generation. But it basically put aside the hard questions about moral life. It didn't try to fill that content. And that's one of the reasons why people have been filling that content themselves. It's why there's now more Christians in China than there are members of the Communist Party. It's why there's this huge revival of Buddhism and Taoism. Because people have basically said, well, what are my commitments to my neighbor? What are my commitments to my family members? What are my commitments to the state? You know, what, what am I ultimately here for as an individual? And I think you know, it's easy to just imagine this pursuit of faith as religion, but it's actually much broader than that. It really is about what you want to dedicate your life towards. And I'll leave you uh, before Q&A with just an example of what that feels like to somebody caught up in it, uh, which is uh, a few years ago um, during the, uh, the Olympics in Beijing, you remember there was this torch relay, and as the sort of torch went around the world, it, was, it generated protests in various places. And there were protests then inside China. There were, pro there were sort of counter protests that were designed uh, to stand up for China's image at home. And some of these were pretty angry. You know, there were protests in front of foreign department stores or foreign uh, establishments. And in the midst of this, there was a video that popped up on the internet. It became hugely popular. And it was called China Stand Up. And it was a pretty angry kind of nationalist manifesto. And it had images of the flag whipping in the wind, and it had pictures of Chairman Mao, and it said, we will never be contained. We will never allow the West to drag us into a new Cold War. 
And it, it became the second most popular video in China. The number one, I think, was a, a, a blooper reel of TV anchors doing something stupid. So some things are universal, I can, I can report. But this thing just became such a phenomenon that I was really interested in, in what it was trying to say and who made it. And uh, so I, I got in touch with the guy who had made it. And I should say, it was, not a, it was a pretty tense time. There was a lot of anger directed at foreign correspondence. There was a, I got an, a, a message on the fax machine in my office uh, that said, correct your misunderstandings on China or you and your loved ones will wish you were dead, which was weird partly because China is not a place that is usually hostile in that way. I was kind of, I'd worked in, the, in Iraq and Egypt and was kind of more accustomed to it. Um, it was off. It seemed weird. And so I got in touch with the guy who made the video. I said, can I come see you? And he said, yeah, you can come see me. And uh, I had an image of who I was probably going to go see. I figured he obviously had to be sort of cut off from the West, or at least the West as I understood it, and I recognized it. He had probably, you know, in his parents' proverbial basement somewhere. Um, and I told friends before I went to go see him, you know, I was kind of in a stage whisper saying how brave I was to go see this guy, you know, tell my family I was doing something valorous. And uh, I show up to see him, and it was quite clear immediately that I was not seeing the person that I had somehow sort of imagined in my mind. Uh, and the guy who had made the video was a guy named Tang Jie, who was 26 years old at the time. He was getting his PhD from Fudan University, which is one of the best schools in China. And he was getting his PhD in Western political philosophy. And as you can see, he was sort of dressed more or less the way I was in khakis and a blue shirt. And, you know, first thing he did when I got there was he tried to pay for my taxi fare. And, uh, and he was getting his, you know, his PhD in Western political philosophy. And I said, well, what are you, what are you writing your dissertation on? Uh, and he said, uh, I'm, I'm writing uh, my dissertation on the subject of phenomenology and the work of Edmund Herschel. And he said, are you familiar with Herschel's work on phenomenology? And I said, of course. Of course. <laughs> Every American is totally familiar with Herschel's uh, <clears throat> work on phenomenal. So, you know, he spoke English and German, and he could read ancient Greek and Latin. And he was a real scholar, and I couldn't, I couldn't sort of square these two things. How was it that he had made this angry document, this angry film, and yet he was also so knowledgeable, uh, kind of enthusiastic and energetic about the West? And he was very, Tung Jai was very generous with me and let me hang around him and his friends for months. Um, and over the course of the next few years, I sort of came to understand a little bit more about what had happened there. And I think it's relevant because we will see more moments like this. And it's a couple things. Number one, you know, they'd grown up in this period, the first period after all of the turbulence and the drama and, the, and really the, the pain and suffering of Chinese political history. They'd grown up more or less after that, after the Cultural Revolution. And so for them, they felt like they had a lot to be proud of in China. And so they didn't like it when the West criticized it. They felt, it felt to them like it wasn't describing the country they recognized. Now, you know, to point out an obvious point, they were going to Chinese public schools where they knew almost nothing about those events in Tiananmen Square, which I mentioned at the outset. Now, they knew almost nothing about the underlying political factors that had contributed to the Cultural Revolution and which in many ways were sort of still unaddressed in China. Um, they didn't know about that. That was unavailable to them. It was kept out of the curriculum. But in some ways, I think it was the last piece that's the most telling and I think the, the most instructive as we think about the future with, with China and the United States. And that's that they had kind of put their hopes in a cosmopolitan mindset. You know, these were the guys who were studying English. They were studying German. They were studying Herschel's impenetrable work on phenomenology. And all of a sudden, they discovered that the West did not think as highly of them as they thought of the West for that. Uh, in that context, and it was galling. It was embarrassing, frankly, because they were, they were the kids who were known among their friends as the, you know, they were the Western-oriented ones. And so they had to be redder than red. You know, they had to stand up to be patriots and to defend the country. And I think what you, what we all should sort of brace for is the idea that this will, there will be more of this in the years ahead, that as China becomes more internationalized, it will also become more nationalistic because it will want to defend what it believes to be ultimately its core identity, which is its Chineseness. And a uh, very final point before Q and A is something interesting, which is after, uh, after he, Tang Jie made this video, it was so successful that uh, he sensed a business opportunity. And so he started a company that was uh, the Chinese nationalist YouTube. 
as he described it to me, and, and, it, and it worked actually. It became quite a successful business. He got venture capital funding and he uh, rented a big office in Beijing and he hired a staff and, um, and as they grew, they got more ambitious and they said, we're not just gonna criticize Western journalists or you know, criticize Western uh, critics of China. We're also going to celebrate who we think in China is doing it right. You know, who is truly living out the dreams of Chairman Mao? And so they started celebrating uh, political figures, people like a guy named Bo Xilai, who was a, uh, a party secretary in Chongqing. And then Bo Xilai ended up on the wrong end of a Chinese political purge and ended up behind bars. And somebody inside the information apparatus, inside the, you know, one of the ministries, the propaganda department, somewhere that who has control over the internet. There are many places that have a hand in this kind of thing. They looked out and they, they looked out over the internet and they said, what's this website that's celebrating Bo Xilai? And they shut it down. They censored it. So, you know, overnight, China's greatest patriot in his own mind uh, was found his own ambitions, his own sort of desire to achieve his pursuit of faith and fortune and all these other things had gone, had run headlong into what the Chinese state is willing to tolerate in its own pursuit of greatness. And that collision right there, that collision between what the individual sets out to achieve within the parameters of their own life and what the state is willing to accommodate or accept, that collision is the central tension in China today. And it's the thing that is the most uh, the most important element in terms of understanding what this country uh, will or will not be in the future. Uh, and it's a source of, of enormous uncertainty. Um, thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it very much. So um, if anybody's got questions, I think uh, you've been uh, there are no perilous mic stands, but you uh, are welcome to come up and uh, ask. I'm ha happy to talk about whatever's on your mind. So, or if you want to ask from there, I can repeat it to the uh, audience. Thank you. Um, now that we have new American leadership, uh, which has very strong views with respect to China, and the tensions are building, North Korea, et cetera, um, are, ch are the changes that you're talking about in China unique within China, or is the arc of that change affected by American leadership? In other words, I guess the short answer is, can America affect the direction and pace of China's adaptation to this new world? That's a really interesting question. I, you know, in some form or another, that question, even in a different American political context, could have been asked 20 years ago or 40 years ago, in a different moment, you know, when we, when we imagined you know, trying to bring China into the international scene or trying to encourage it to adopt a more, uh, a more sort of international style conception of human rights. At the moment, you know, what does the American global vision you know, of this administration, what does it ask of China? It asks a very different set of commitments, actually. It's kind of fascinating. I mean, you, you know, what are we asking of China? We're asking China to redefine our trade relationship. We're asking China to uh, not pursue its territorial ambitions. Um, but I think even more so than before November 8th, the idea that we would be able to bring about a change in China seems hard for me to envision. I think that you know our the, the the sort of character of our relationship with China now is, um, if anything, I think it will probably consolidate the hands of people within China who say we will define the arc of our own experience. But I, you know, the reason why I hesitate is that I have to tell you I was I think a lot clearer on where the U.S.-China relationship was going. Um, until this administration came in, because the one place that I would, that I might depart from your characterization is that I think that they have, uh, they have emphatic ideas about China, but maybe not strong ideas about China, in the sense that they came in with a set of ideas, but it's not at all clear to me which ones are core commitments and which ones are flexible. My own sense has been, just in talking to his, to Trump's China advisors over the course of the last year, uh, eighteen months is that 
you know, they had a campaign message on China that made total sense, but it was not a governing message on China, meaning that, you know, uh, pursuing a more, um, a more hostile relationship on trade and, uh, and, and really the sort of China, China, China version that, that, that Trump ran on. My own hunch is that much like the way that his Syria policy has evolved rather quickly over the course of the last week, I have a feeling that his China policy is very much a work in progress. And I don't think we know what it is that he's really seeking out of the relationship at all. And it will be defined to some degree, not only by events in the region, but also by events elsewhere. And, you know, Trump may turn out in this sense to be conventional to the degree that almost every administration comes into office saying, I'm going to redraw the parameters of the U.S.-China relationship. And with few exceptions, they decide after a little while, you know what? It's the one part of the world that's not in flames. I might leave it as is. It's one of the reasons why we've ended up where we are on it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The question was about uh, the blue tie. So the blue tie uh, was worn by Wang Qishan in that picture. And Wang Qishan was, uh, as some of you know, a member of the Standing Committee of the Politburo. But more importantly, he was also the head of the anti-corruption campaign, is still the head of the anti-corruption campaign. And so, uh, you know, from a sort of Kremlinological perspective or Zhong Nan Hai, uh, uh, you know, ology, um, it became pretty clear that the blue tie was not just a blue tie. He then later, a week later, when everybody else was wearing little windbreakers, they all sort of travel like a team. When everybody else was wearing windbreakers, he was wearing a sport coat. And then it would, it would repeat itself. He was always just a few degrees off from everybody else. And it was, you know, we have to entertain, entertain ourselves somehow in China analysis. And we basically concluded, you know, he was setting himself apart a little bit. And I think it's actually turned out to be true. He's the internal affairs guy, for lack of a better analogy. And he's saying, look, I'm part of this, but I'm not utterly of this. I am, I am a part because I am ultimately the one who is going to uh, ride herd over this party. And he's turned out to be, you know, if you're a, a rank and file Communist Party member, he's a, a kind of menacing figure from your perspective. Thank you. I always saw the picture like that. It was like um, Paul McCartney on the Abbey Road album. So, <laughs> I so, think he would like the inspiration. Yeah. Thank you very much. The book is fantastic. And oh, the thanks talk a lot. Was, was excellent. Thank you very much. Really thank you very that. much. I planted him in the audience to say that. I hope you'll. <laughs> and I have the little red, little red envelope <laughs> yeah, to prove exactly. it. Exactly. Um, the, my question is, uh, looking at the patriotic education campaign and nationalism, you really pinpointed that at the end. I'd like to hear your opinion on the what is a stronger, are they responding to public opinion that's moving faster than the government, or is the government feeding that, or where do you see the direction of that, and particularly now and in the future? It's a really interesting dynamic, because it is both, actually. I mean, to some degree, the patriotic phenomenon, the nationalist phenomenon, was politically constructed in one, in one way, which is that after Tiananmen, there was this feeling that there was clearly... Um, a kind of liquefaction of ideological coherence. They had to figure out how are we going to pull people together again. And one of the ways they did it, and this is all quite, you know, uh, it's detailed in party literature, is that they were going to do what's called the party, the patriotic education campaign. And that's what they did. And they created um, a much greater sense of grievance about ways in which the outside world had harmed China through its history. And if you were a kid in school, all of a sudden you had a certain number of field trips every year that were mandated to go visit the site of battles that China had lost. I mean, it's a really specific kind of message, which is, we have been victimized and we shall never forget. And that became a, a much more prominent part of the spirit of education. And, and um, there was a, at one point, there was a proposal for a holiday called National Humiliation Day, uh, which doesn't, it wasn't as fun as it sounds, and so it never, um, wasn't actually put in place. But the National humil Humiliation Narrative, you know, it's actually a really big deal, um, because it defines in some ways how people have come to see Chinese history. But then there's another piece of it, which is that it's not all artificial. There's some of it is really a deeply felt. You know, China has a lot of reasons to be angry at what happened to it over the course of the last hundred years. You know, the way that it was abused during war and carved up like a melon is the term that young Chinese people, actually people of all ages, will use to describe the Chinese territories that were carved off into different national 
uh, districts. And so, in some ways, it, the leaders today know that if they went soft, so to speak, on China's um, national character, that they would face a domestic political risk. How much? I don't know. And they exploit that ambiguity quite effectively, because it's a little bit like what you used to hear in Egypt when I was living in Egypt, which is, you know, Hosni Mubarak would say, after me, it is the deluge. And there is a little bit of that in China, too. They say, you know, if you don't like this party, well, you will not like the guys that come after me, because they're all going to be nationalist crazies. And we don't really know. And that's part of the mystery. But yeah, there is a grassroots element, and then there's also a top-down generated element, I think. Excellent talk. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Um, I thought I heard on the news this week that China is now offering, the government's offering the equivalent of $70,000 for turning in <laughs> suspected spies. Yeah. Uh, that has a bunch of problems. <laughs> and yeah. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on it, how it might affect things. Yeah. Yeah, I heard that and I thought to myself, God, you know, I could have turned in one of the guys I knew and gotten 70,000 bucks. That's pretty good, actually. But I don't think I was the intended audience uh, for that deal. You know, it's, um, it's concerning. It's not, it's not altogether new. The, it's, it's been, so for people who may have missed it, it was rolled out in a very odd way. It was essentially a cartoon that has been circulated. And also there's a propaganda campaign around the idea that we must be alert to foreign infiltration by intelligence assets who are seeking to divide and to vanquish us. And it sounds, you know, so kind of Cold War and old fashioned, but it is a window into, this is why it's so interesting, and I'm really uh, thrilled that you brought it up, because it is a window into the psychology of the leadership. It's almost unintentionally revealing about how they perceive themselves to be vulnerable to the kind of color revolutions which rippled across Central Asia and Central Europe. And from their perspective, you know, their nightmare scenario, if you're Xi Jinping, the thing you think about when you're staring at the ceiling at night is Ukraine. You know, it's the idea that, or God forbid, from his perspective, Libya, where a strong leader was, you know, hounded into a culvert and killed with his own gun. I mean, that is your dictator's nightmare. And so they worry about whether or not they are genuinely vulnerable to outside agitation. And their view is that they are. I, you know, I without getting into a whole side discussion about the nature of U.S. intelligence in China, I think that this campaign is an odd one and probably not ultimately very successful. I mean, the cartoon shows a picture of a guy like me with a big nose kind of asking nosy questions about the electrical grid and uh, you're supposed to turn him in. Um, it, I'm not sure that's exactly the way you're going to get American intelligence uh, elements. But it is a window into genuine fragility and self-consciousness, I think, among the leadership. Thanks again for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. <laughs>